Today we're going to begin talking about a very large subject, agriculture. And before we get into the subject, what I'd like you to do is set the stage for the students and tell us about Fort Collins, the land, and those first people that came here. For a long time, before anybody came here to live, there were Native Americans roaming the area, and they lived by trapping animals. And then trappers started to come in the early part of the 19th century, around the 1830s and 40s. One trapper in particular, whose name was Antoine Janice, came in 1842 with his father, who was a trapper, and he was so entranced by the beauty of this valley that he decided he was going to come back here and make it his home. He is considered the first settler in the Kashlapooter Valley. And there's an interesting story, by the way, about how the Kashlapooter got its name. In French, Kashlapooter means hide the powder. So the story goes, there are some different stories, but the story most commonly told is that Janice's father and his group were on a, a trapping expedition and their wagons got too heavy because the weather got bad and so they decided to bury much of what they were carrying with them deeply enough that the Native Americans wouldn't find it and take it. And a lot of what they buried was gunpowder. And when they came back several months later, everything was still there. So that's how the river got its name. But in 1856, Antoine Janice came back. He built a cabin along the river. He was not, however, a grower. He was a trapper. And they roamed around the area to find food and game. We didn't really have anything growing here until the settlers started coming. So with the abundant wildlife and the trappers coming to Fort Collins, can you tell us about the migration of people and how they came out here and why? In the 1850s, word spread that there was gold in California and people started heading to California. It happened that a great many of them either couldn't make it across the mountains, which if you can imagine crossing a mountain pass with a wagon and a team, it would be very difficult. So some of them just stopped when they got to this area. We had maybe half a dozen settlers here before the fort came, and the fort came in 1862. After the fort closed in 1867, following the end of the Civil War, many of the soldiers stayed, and they wrote home to their friends back east, and they said, this is a beautiful place, there is land here. And I should mention that in 1863 or 4, Abraham Lincoln signed the Homesteaders Act which allowed for people to come to these areas west of the Mississippi, claim 160 acres by building a house on it, digging a well, and growing a crop, and staying for five years. They didn't have to pay anything but the filing fee. And that was a great lure for people who were trying to survive on small farms in the more crowded east or who were in big cities and it was difficult to make a living. So they imagined themselves coming out here and owning a small farm or maybe starting a business in the town and having a new life. Can you tell us how early produce and livestock, uh, first how they came to Fort Collins and then how they uh, changed how people looked at their homes here in Fort Collins? Among the first crops that were grown here were um, wheat and corn. And in 1872, many of the farmers had a terrible setback because there was an invasion of grasshoppers. Now this is hard to imagine. You have to really shut your eyes and picture millions and millions and millions of grasshoppers flying through the air so they made a big black cloud and then settling down somewhere where there was something to eat. Well, something to eat would be the crops that people had planted. And when they 
left, there was nothing on the ground, not even a blade of grass. People would hang their clothes out to dry. The grasshoppers would eat their clothes. This went on for three years, 1872, 73, and 74, and it takes a really cold winter to kill the grasshoppers. So finally, they had a really, really cold winter. They didn't know then how to manage the insects. And many of them left, but enough of them stayed that the town was able to survive. And, and they did plant different crops. Yes, alfalfa, rye, and beans, and some other crops of that nature that were less, perhaps less tempting. And they learned a little bit about rotating the crops so that they didn't plant in the same place all the time. Tell us a little bit about how the arrival of trains impacted um, produce and the livestock market here. People who lived in Fort Collins, there were maybe two or 3,000 people at the most, including the surrounding farm areas, felt that they were being deprived of profit because in order to get their produce to market, which was Denver, you had to haul it in a wagon. That was a two-day trip, get, it, get the produce down there, and it wasn't as fresh as it would have been, or get the livestock down there and try to keep them alive, and sell the produce and then two more days back to town. So they lobbied really hard to get the train line to come up to Fort Collins, and sure enough it did. In 1877, when the train first came through, I think we mentioned that before, people cheered. And the main reason was now they could get their produce to market or their livestock to market in less than a day. Once we have the train, now we are no longer creating produce just for our own family, and the farms can now sustain and grow. Tell us about the products they now start to grow. Around the turn of the century, they started growing sugar beets here. Sugar beets produce, well, obviously, sugar. And they are huge. They're about this high and this big around. And they were growing sugar beets and getting them to a sugar beet factory, which was south of here, they wanted their own factory here. So a group of businessmen got together, and in 1904, the Great Western Sugar Beet Factory opened, which meant that the farmers could get their produce, their beets, to the sugar beet factory in just a few hours, have the beets processed, and make a, a substantial profit by doing that. And sugar beets were a lot easier to grow than other crops for some reason, our climate is exactly right for sugar beets. Tell me about who's harvesting all these beets. Did the farmers do this themselves or did they need to get workers? They had to get workers. And the first workers who came were people who were called Russian Germans. And the reason they're called that is that they were Germans who had been lured to Russia by Catherine the Great, who was the ruler there. And she promised them land, and she promised them prosperity. And they found out that her promises weren't being kept. So many of them migrated to the United States. And when they learned about the sugar beet industry here, and, and it was also in Kansas and Nebraska, this was ideal for them because they knew how to grow the sugar beets, and they knew how to tend to them. They knew how to harvest them. They knew what to do with them. So the first workers in the fields were the Russian Germans were growing different crops, the sugar beets. Tell me what problems came with that crop. The biggest problem is probably getting water to the crops. Sugar beets require a lot of water. If you've ever seen, these are root crops. If you've ever seen root crops, there's just some greenery on the top and then the growing is happening underneath. And then you had to run ditches along, irrigation ditches, and get water to the beets down in the ground, not on top of the ground. So they had to dig trenches and run the water along the ground. And water in the arid west is, has been, and always will be a problem. In the 1870s, when the grasshoppers came, there was a severe drought, and they weren't conserving the water. In the 1900s, there was another drought, and again, they, weren't, they didn't know how to conserve the water. They didn't know how to save it. So that was a big problem with the sugar beets and then getting it harvested. One thing they did after the beets were harvested, there's a lot of pulp left over. 
So they would take the pulp left over from processing the beets, and that made good feed for the cattle. So as long as there was a good crop, then they had feed for the cattle, and they had the beets for sugar. We're going to talk a little bit about the machinery that's involved in agriculture and the development of that over time. And Before machinery, farmers plowed with a device that had a sharp edge on it and two handles, and they walked behind the plow. Imagine trying to do all that, that all day long. But more, more of them were pulled by horses, and they had the big draft horses. The but Clydesdales. Like, Clydesdales. Yep, you can go and see them if you want to. Similar to that with the great big legs, and, and they were strong, strong horses. So they could pull the plows, and then the, the beets had to be thinned, and, and that had to be done by hand. And then they had to harvest the beets. And for other crops, they had a thresher that is mechanized, but before the days of the thresher and other harvesting, beets and so forth, they used to have parties. And everybody from around the area would come to one farmer's place. They would work all day or however many days it took to get the crop in. And then they'd go to the next farm and do it all over again. So it was a community gathering. And that was a good thing about it. But the labor, it was very labor intensive. It took a long time long time. With the advent of the automobile, which we also talked about earlier, along came other machines. And by 1915 or 16, there was a tractor that the farmer could use to do many of these tasks, but they were extremely expensive. So the farmer who could afford a tractor could get his crop in and planted much sooner than anyone who couldn't afford that. They were still using horses. In fact, up through the 1930s, through the Great Depression, most farmers around here still used horses because they couldn't afford the tractors. But big machinery did start to be designed and, and built, threshing machines. I don't know if, if you've ever seen one, but they go across, almost across an entire field, and they just churn up and thresh. Now there are all kinds of machines to do these chores. So I'm glad you mentioned the Great Depression because that was a major effect all over the country. And I want to know how did that affect Fort Collins? How did that affect the people, the agriculture? Going back to the earliest times of agriculture, the way farmers have always done their planting is to borrow money from the bank to buy the seed and grow the crop and then when the crop is harvested, they're able to pay back the bank, and then they're able to live the rest of the year. Up until the time of the Great Financial Depression, when banks failed, many farmers here and elsewhere lost their money because they had loans that they couldn't repay, or they had savings in the bank that they couldn't get out. And it was extremely difficult. And so during the 1930s, what was called the Agricultural Extension Service came along to help people make the best of what they had. They would go out and show the wives how to bake bread creatively, how to can food, how to grow crops that were less vulnerable. Because along with the financial problems, there was drought. And then in 1935, 36, thereabouts, there was an invasion of creatures that were called Mormon crickets. They aren't grasshoppers. They're actually katydids, and they're about three inches long. And they, like grasshoppers, they swarm millions of them in a cloud, and they eat whatever is handy, and then they swarm again and move on. So not only did the farmers have to cope with the, the drought and a lack of money, they also had to cope with the Mormon crickets. But at the college, they were busy doing research about how to prevent this from happening again. So Barbara, can you tell us about the early livestock? In the beginning, there were cattle ranches and sheep ranches, and the cattle ranchers didn't get along very well with the sheep ranchers. 
because the cattle ranchers said the sheep cropped the grass too close to the ground so the cattle couldn't eat. And the cattle and the sheep kind of roamed freely. But in the 1870s, barbed wire was invented, and barbed wire has little sharp little points on it, as I'm sure you know, that would prevent the cattle and the sheep from roaming and encountering each other. So we've had then and still have a pretty active and thriving cattle industry. But in 1899, a trainload of sheep got stranded in Colorado Springs in a blizzard. And the owners of the sheep who were planning to bring them to market were afraid that they were going to die of starvation. But they had heard that if they could get the sheep to Fort Collins, there was good alfalfa there, stored alfalfa that they could feed the sheep and fatten them up. And so they brought them up here. And lo and behold, right here, or right surrounding Fort Collins, a sheep industry was born. And there were many people in Fort Collins who got really, really rich on the sheep. But with the advent of World War I, that industry faded because everybody's efforts was turning, turned toward winning the war. And that's the same thing, incidentally, that happened during World War II. Those industries kind of took a back seat because the focus was on winning the war. So we still have a sheep industry here, but it isn't anything like thousands and thousands and thousands of sheep that we used to have. So Barbara, one of the things the kids will make an immediate connection to is how the sheep industry still is part of Fort Collins. Can you tell us a little bit about the Lampkin and about um, our CSU Ram? About 1918, 1919, the Fort Collins High School football coach decided that Fort Collins High School needed a mascot. Well, we still had a lot of sheep and lambs around here, and somebody in the, in the class the coach was teaching said, well, what about lambkin? Because there are all these lambs frolicking around, and, and everybody liked that. And so now the Fort Collins High mascot is the lambkins. And that's where that came from. And then later, the university decided to use a ram with the big horns as their mascot. So we have the Lampkins at Fort Collins High School and Cam the Ram at CSU. It's nice to have those historical connections through our mascots. So Barbara, this is a large subject, and we're going to come back to this at another time. And we're going to talk about some of the early farmers and the specific family farms that are here in Fort Collins. And we're also going to look at the Agriculture and Mechanical College and how that turned into CSU. So thank you.